In the last lecture, we looked at how the Bitcoin network processes transactions. In particular, we looked at two data structures uh, that they use. One is the mempool, which holds the pending transactions, and one is called the UTXO pool, which is a representation of the past transactions. It's a subset of all the information that's on the blockchain, a subset that, that they need to maintain. Uh, transactions themselves have a particular data structure. Uh, they're put into blocks, which also have a particular data structure that was, that was covered earlier. Now what we want to do is we want to focus on the nodes on the network that are doing this mining operation. Um, and what is it that, what are the properties of Bitcoin that come out of this uh, sort of mining process? Why is it the way that it is? Um, you know, these are, are sort of the questions that we're going to think about here. Okay, so uh, we call this consensus because the outcome of this whole process should be that everyone um, sort of coalesces behind a single blockchain. Okay, so anybody can add any blocks they want to the blockchain. Uh, you can even go back in time and you can remove blocks and, and extend from anywhere you want. And so um, what, what we want from a consensus mechanism is that everybody ends up looking at ex essentially the same copy of the blockchain. So there's, there's one way to establish what is the consensus view of the network. And then we want to make sure that, that everyone's on board with it and it's valid and, and a bunch of other kinds of properties. Okay, so let's let's start by thinking about what is it, let's say you want to mine, okay? So you have your Bitcoin software, you turn on the mining process. Uh, so you go out, you download the blockchain, you get the UTXO pool, you start collecting transactions and all of these things. What, what exactly are the steps that you're going to do? So the first thing you'll do is you're going to obtain um, the current blockchain. And there might be different versions of it, and uh, we'll, we'll see where those versions come from, okay? Uh, and the simple way of thinking about which is the right blockchain is the longest blockchain, okay? The one that has uh, the most blocks, but this is a simplification. Technically, what you want is the one that has the most work done on it. So every time you add a block, you have to do some work uh, in order to add that block. So it goes without saying that the longest blockchain will be the one with the most work. The only sort of subtlety here is the amount of work that gets done can change. It can change dynamically. And so you might technically have one blockchain that's slightly longer than another blockchain, uh, but actually has less work because the work that was being done was, was smaller. Um, anyways, this, this basically never arises in practice, but um, if we want to be very precise about it, we'll say uh, the one, uh, the chain that has the most work. Okay, and in particular, what we want is we want the, the last block. So we're going to call this the previous block, even though we don't have a next block yet, but that's what, that's what we're trying to find. Okay, so we take this previous block. Um, uh, in particular, it's, it's actually the header of it, uh, so we can say that. Um, so this is the header. So the header is the hash uh, of uh, the previous block, okay? And we'll, we'll see what goes in this hash because we're going to repeat recursively that structure here. Then what we're going to do is we're going to take all our transactions, okay? So we have a bunch of transactions. Um, maybe they're from the mempool. Uh, maybe we have some private transactions that we want to mix in. Uh, we're going to aggregate them together. We're going to put them in a Merkle tree. Uh, and then we're going to take the root of the Merkle tree. And we're going to concatenate it onto the end of the previous block. Okay. And then what we're going to do is uh, we want to hash this stuff together. And in order to do, make it a proof of work, uh, we're not going to just accept the first hash that comes out. What we're going to do is we're going to say we want some, we want hard to find a hash. Uh, we want to put some constraints or restrictions on this hash. Uh, so the way that it happens is there's this target, target value, and we have to find a hash that's smaller than this target. Okay. Now if we hash these two things, every time we hash them, we'll end up with the same number. And so in order to ensure that we can generate lots and lots of different hashes, uh, we add a third value, which is called the nonce. 
uh, which is just like a random number. You can think of it as a counter. You, you don't have to necessarily, you know, go zero, one, two, three, four, five, but that's, that's the idea of the nonce. And no one cares what it is. Um, it can be anything, uh, but, but when you, uh, if you happen to solve this block, meaning that you find a hash that's smaller than this target, uh, you will have to tell everybody what this nonce value is, uh, and then they're gonna check that the, three, the hash of these three things is indeed smaller than the target. Okay. So this is the, the proof of work. Uh, now this target, where does it come from? How do we know um, how big it should be, that type of thing? Um, so the target is actually chosen by the network and it's reconfigured. Uh, so over time, the target will change and the network will uh, take care of it. Uh, so uh, it, it's about every two weeks, um, assuming that it takes a 10 minute interval to solve a block. Uh, that would be exactly 2016 blocks. Okay, so exactly every 2016 blocks, which, which is approximately every two weeks, um, what will happen is it will reconfigure the difficulty of the target. And what this reconfiguration looks like is uh, we take a weighted average of what's called the block interval time. Uh, which is just a fancy way of saying, how long did it take between blocks? Um, so with a certain proof of work, um, the ideal target that we want is we want it to take about 10 minutes. So that's what Bitcoin parameterizes around. Um, but in, in practice, because this is sort of a random event, uh, you might get lucky and you might solve a, you know, the network might solve it in two minutes instead of 10 minutes. Uh, other times it might take 20 minutes, okay? Uh, so we're never going to get it precisely at 10 minutes, but what we want is, is it to sort of average out to 10 minutes, okay? So what we do is we say, well, how, how long is it between blocks, okay? Uh, and we, we basically look at what blocks were solved. Blocks include a timestamp. The timestamp is an assertion because there's no uniform clock. There's no one clock on the wall that everyone's referencing. And so there's certain rules about rejecting blocks where the timestamps are, are kind of way off. So there is a little bit of wiggle room uh, in, in terms of the times itself. But anyways, what we do is we accept blocks with an asserted time, time stamp, assuming that it's within a certain uh, bound uh, of our, our own current version of, of what time it is. Uh, and then uh, what we do is we, we, we collect this for two weeks and then we're gonna take an average of it. Okay, and then if, if it averages out to eight minutes, then we're going to make it a more difficult proof of work because it's being solved too quickly. If it averages out to 12 minutes, then we might make it an easier proof of work. Generally, what we've seen with Bitcoin is that the number of networks that join, uh, or sorry, the number of nodes that join the network increases over time. Therefore, the computational power of the network increases over time. Therefore, the block interval time decreases over time. And so we're almost always making the problem harder. We make it harder and harder and harder. It's, it's usually not the case that it, you make it easier, but, but it does happen uh, where, uh, you know, for one particular two week window, you might, you might make it easier. Um, okay, so we have a, a weighted average of uh, block intervals, uh, and then we adjust the target. And so there's a whole algorithm for, you know, if it's eight minutes, how, how exactly, you know, how much do you shave off the target or how much do you increase the target by in order to, to translate that into sort of time. And so I won't go through the details of the algorithm, but basically there's, there's this algorithm that will adjust the target. Um, so uh, block interval goes back to 10 minutes. In other words, had the target been the new current value, then over this two week period, we, we would expect to see an average of 10 minutes, okay? And this is all sort of, this is, I don't want to make it sound like it's a sort of real, it's an estimate is what I want to say, but uh, I don't want to make it sound like it's totally pulled out of the sky. Like um, it is fairly easy to sort of interpolate uh, the values that you need. But at the same time, you know, the size of the network and, and things like that change. Uh, people get lucky, that changes as well. Although, uh, you know, with 21, six, or 2016 blocks, uh, 
um, luck is basically going to average out. You know, sometimes you get lucky and you uh, get lucky and it's faster. Sometimes you get lucky and it, it you get unlucky if you want to think of it that way and it takes longer. Those tend to average out and they tend to converge very, very quickly. That's um, a, a very common sort of statistical law uh, that, that we see. But uh, anyways, there, there, is, there is a little bit of um, uh, sort of nuance to this or there's, there's you know, it's, it's not an exact science. Okay. Okay, so this is the, the target. Okay, so anyways, this is what you're trying to do as a miner. Now, what will happen is, um, let's assume that, for example, for, just to start off, let's assume that uh, everyone is producing valid blocks. So nobody's trying to deceive you and, and try and sneak in a block that's invalid or something like that. Okay, so let's just start with this base case. So we're going to uh, assume only valid blocks. And so this is the sort of dynamic that you'll see. Uh, when you join the network, uh, you'll see that there's this blockchain uh, of previous blocks, and we'll assume that this is the longest chain. And so this ends up being uh, the pre what you're going to set as the previous block. Okay. And then what you're going to do is you're going to take your transactions, put them in a Merkle root. You'll set this as the previous block. And what you'll do is you'll start trying to solve a block that's going to extend this block. In other words, a block where the previous block is this particular block. Okay, so this is you. Uh, you're sitting here trying to do this work. Now, let's say that somebody else comes along. You're listening to the network and they say, hey, we, we just solved it. Okay, we, we're also trying to solve uh, the next block. And so we have a solution here, uh, which extends uh, this previous block. Okay, now, you're sitting here and you have a choice to make, okay? The choice that you make is, is very simple. You can continue, there's nothing stopping you from continuing to try and solve this block, okay? Or what you can do is you can join in uh, with this block and you can you know, set this uh, to be the previous block and you can start extending it, okay? And what we want is, Notice that if you solve this block and there's already a solution to this block, then we have two chains. There's the chain that goes to this block and there's a chain that goes to this block. We call that a fork. So a fork is uh, when you have two chains uh, where you know most of the chain is common and then it kind of splits off at the end. Okay, so that's, that's called a fork. Uh, so we have a fork here, um, so that's fine. Uh, so the, we don't want forks. So if we, we're, we're aiming for a consensus, and so consensus basically means that there's going to be one chain, or it's very easy to establish which chain is correct. And so we don't want a lot of forks and splintering and things like that. So we much prefer a world where uh, as soon as purple is, is sort of announced that everyone switches over to working on it as opposed to trying to compete with it. Okay, that, that would be good for consensus. Um, so the question is, well, why would you do one of these two things? Would you actually want to do two or would you try and do one? Okay, and so we can think about this uh, in terms of a, a couple of facts. So the first thing I want to do is I want to just make a quick copy of this um, so we have it handy. Okay, and what I want you to note is that the probability that the hash of this comes out to be less than the target is independent uh, for every time you try it. So if you, if you try the nonce, you, you try nonce zero, you try nonce one, you try nonce two, uh, the probability that this hash comes out less than the target, um, you, you know, it has some probability and you can write down exactly what that probability is, some small probability, but it doesn't matter how many nonces you've tried. You could try a hundred nonces, you could try a thousand nonces. The probability that the next nonce that you try will make it smaller than the target is the same, regardless of, of how many uh, nonces that you've, you've tried in the past, okay? Um, so what that means is it doesn't really matter if First off, what you're doing in the in the course of the proof of work is that you're tweaking this. Okay, you're tweaking it as fast as you can. So you'll 
Uh, you'll try one value. If it doesn't work, you tweak it. If it doesn't work, you tweak it. If it doesn't work, it, you tweak it, okay? If you tweak this value and this value, right? So if you uh, become number two here, and uh, what's the difference between one and two at the level of this? Well, at the level of this, the difference between one and two is just basically that this value changes, okay? And all you're doing is you're really changing, you have one value that's changing inside the hash function, now you're changing two values inside the hash function. It has no impact on what the output of the hash function is. As long as you're changing something in the hash inside the hash function, the output is going to completely change. It's going to be random, a random change, okay? So changing the previous block doesn't make it any less likely that this hash will come out to a previous target, okay? So this is, um, you know, this sort of goes against our intuition. Uh, there's, there's a very famous thing called the gambler's uh, fallacy, uh, which is that, you know, if you're playing a game of chance and you lose and you lose and you lose, somehow you're more likely to win on the next hand than if you just sat down and played the first hand. Okay, but the way probability works, the way that, that independent events work within probability is it doesn't matter if you've had a losing streak of you know 20 turns, you're not any more likely to win on that 21th turn than if you'd won 20 times in a row or that you just sat down and it's your very first time playing, okay? The probability in an independent event is the same. It doesn't matter what the history is, okay? And so the fact that you spend a lot of time trying to solve this doesn't make it any more likely that you're gonna solve it, okay? So the, the probability of solving one and the probability of solving two is exactly the same. They're the exact same probability, uh, regardless of how long you've spent trying to, to solve uh, number one, okay? Uh, so what that means is that when a new block comes along, you can tweak this and it's not gonna change anything in terms of how likely you are to succeed, okay? So you can uh, tweak uh, when new blocks come. The other thing too that, that's easy to fall into thinking is that let's say you have a bunch of transactions and some new transactions come in, okay? But you've already started your proof of work on one set of transactions, right? Uh, isn't that kind of like wasted computation if you, if you update your transactions? If you update your transactions, it's going to change the Merkle root. But the answer is no, because the probability that this comes out less than the target is going to be the same, right? Whether it's it's a Merkle root that you've spent a long time tweaking, or if it's a brand new Merkle root, it doesn't doesn't make a difference. Okay, um, so as new transactions come in and you want to include them, of course there is a little bit of work in terms of actually computing this Merkle root value. Okay, but we'll we'll talk a little later how miners are set up for parallel computation, and so this this is a fixed overhead that that's basically marginal. Um, but anyways, you, you feel free to tweak uh, this value uh, when new transactions come in. Okay, so basically you're tweaking, tweaking, tweaking this value. Some new transactions come in, then you tweak both of these values, then you go back to tweaking this value, right? A new transaction comes in, you tweak these two values, then you go back to tweaking this value. Then someone solves a new block, then you tweak this value. You're probably gonna to have to tweak this value because some of the transactions that are in your set are gonna be covered in the other set. And you'll tweak this value and then you'll go back to tweaking this value. So it doesn't matter if, you're you, know, if you change all three of these values, if you change two of them, or if you only change one of them, uh, the probability that you'll win um, and you'll solve the next block is exactly the same, okay? So uh, let's, let's try and, and write this down very informally, but, but we'll write it down nonetheless. Um, so the probability of solving one and the probability of solving two are the same. So the probability that you solve one is the same as the probability that you solve two. Okay, you're probably indifferent to whether you solve this one or you solve this one. Okay, you'll get a mining reward in both cases, unless if the mining reward happens to change right when you're solving this block. Uh, and we'll, we'll talk about that schedule later. Um, you know, it basically makes no difference. Uh, maybe there's like a really high fee transaction where you know, you'd really like to grab that. And so maybe the transactions in this block are paying you less fees than the one 
uh, that goes in this block. But you know, in general, you're you're basically sort of indifferent, and we, we can talk about what happens in a second if if there's a particularly high fee. Then then there is a chance that maybe you would prefer to be one as opposed to two. Um, but anyways, the probability that you solve one and the probability you solve two is exactly the same. It doesn't matter how much time you've spent on one, and you're typically indifferent. to solving one uh, or two. Okay, if you solve one of them, that's great. You'll get the money and reward and, and which one you solve doesn't really matter. Okay, and then the final thing, and this is, is sort of the most important thing, is um, when this new block is uh, sort of announced, most of the other people on the network, most of the other miners, they're going to start working on solving this particular block. Okay, so this is most miners. Okay, and so even if you, let's say that when this block is announced, you keep working on one, and let's say you actually win. You win. So now there's two uh, blocks at this particular level. So there's two chains of equal length, one that goes to purple and one that goes to your blue. Well, most of the miners will hear about the purple first, so they've already switched. And because your chain isn't any longer than the purple chain, then just because you found this block, right, uh, doesn't mean that they're going to switch uh, and, and try and, and mine on top of your block, okay? And if, if they uh, start mining on top of this block, right, then the chances that this becomes the longest chain, right, they're, they're probably going to you know, usually you're, you're not the fastest node in the network, um, or you, you don't have more power as an individual than the entire rest of the network, okay? So the chances that they extend this block, uh, there's a higher probability of that than there is of you extending your own block, okay? So the only way that this really makes sense here, or there's a couple ways, but, but the one dominant way that we'll think about now, and we'll think about it a slightly different corner case in a second, um, the most dominant way that this, this would make sense is if most of the network hasn't heard about this when you solve this, okay? So for example, let's say that these are solved almost at exactly the same time. Maybe you had every intention to extend this block when you heard about it, but you just happened on a solution before you could kind of switch over, okay? So now there's two solutions. They sort of circulate the network at around the same time. So half of the miners end up here and half of the, the miners end up here. Now you kind of have equal chances uh, of, of either of these becoming part of the main chain, okay? Uh, if they're left, let's say that you solve this and um, this chain grows faster, then eventually all the miners will, will join the longest chain, okay? And so your block will be left on the side. It will be discarded. It's called an orphan uh, in Bitcoin uh, parlance. Okay, so the, the final thing is that um, um, okay, I'm, I'm going to phrase this slightly different. Um, so we're here, and let's say that uh, you have a choice between uh, extending this previous block one or extending this pro uh, block two. And let's say we can split the universe in two, okay? So in, in one universe, you keep working on one, and in the second universe, you work on two. And let's say that you know in two minutes in the future or some set amount of time in both universes, you find your relative solutions, okay? So in the first universe, you find a solution to this. And in the second universe, you find a solution to this. And they happen at the same time, okay? Which one's more likely to be incorporated in the chain, okay? Well, this one, you know, most of the miners are working on extending this already. Okay, so if you come along two minutes later and nobody's going to switch uh, to your chain because it's not longer than the current chain, then basically nobody's going to be working on extending this chain except for maybe you. Okay, uh, whereas if you announce two, then this chain is now super long, right? You have the purple block plus you have this block two added on the end. Then all the miners are going to start working on the end of your chain. Okay. And so the probability that two will get incorporated is very, very high. And the probability that one will get incorporated is very, very low because one has a competing block, one that was solved before it, and two doesn't have a competing block, okay? So the probability 
uh, that 2 is incorporated is much, much greater than the probability that 1 is incorporated. Okay, so the probability that you solve 1 and 2 are the same. The financial incentives between solving 1 and 2 are basically the same, but the probability that 2 is incorporated is far greater than the probability that 1 is incorporated. So what should you do if you have these three conditions? Well, the conclusion is that you should do 2, okay? So you should do this instead of doing this, okay? The only time that that might not be the case is, let's say that there was a financial difference. For some reason, 2 you know, was, was far uh, more profitable. Sorry, let's say that 1 was far more profitable than 2, okay? So 1 is more profitable, but it also has a lower probability of incorporating being incorporated, okay? So you could do an expected value where you take the probability of this and multiply it by how much you would make by solving one. You take the probability of this and multiply it by how much you would uh, make solving two. Then maybe there's some condition where you would continue to work on one. Um, you know, and, and you'd have to put an exact number. So it depends on how quickly does this probability, you know, go to zero. Uh, that this will be incorporated given that, that this was already established. Uh, plus, it also has to do with the actual financial difference uh, between these two. So if this would had like some enormous fee for some particular reason, and this has happened sometimes in Bitcoin, people make mistakes or something like that, and uh, a transaction is, you know, includes a ridiculously high fee. Uh, maybe there's, there's an argument to be made uh, that you would compete with the block instead of just extending it. But anyways, in 99.9% .9 of the cases, uh, what's going to happen is it's it's far better for you as a miner to, to just extend a block once it's announced than to try and compete with it, okay? And so this is really great for consensus because what it does is it drives you towards, um, you know, sort of um, backing the longest chain. So whenever somebody else announces a block, you don't, you don't spin your wheels trying to compete with it. You just say, okay, great, and then you move on to extending it, okay? So everyone sort of is walking in the same direction. Uh, and, and so you can uh, sort of achieve consensus. And usually the only time this goes is wrong is just by chance two people tend to solve it at roughly the same time. They're not trying to be malicious by competing with another block. They just, you know, they, they came up with a solution bef before they heard about another solution. This person came up with a solution before they heard about the other person's solution. Okay, then there is some forking of the network. And so uh, some people will work on one chain and some people will work on the other chain, but by chance, eventually one of those chains will become longer. And as soon as one of them becomes longer, then for these exact arguments, everybody should switch over to the longest chain. Okay, so there's no, there's no reason not to switch to the longest chain once you've established what the, the longest chain actually is. Okay, so these are sort of the dynamics that we see in play. Okay, uh, the next key part is uh, we made this assumption uh, that blocks are, are uh, valid. Okay, so that no one's malicious here. They're not releasing invalid blocks. Okay, so we assume only valid blocks. So let's remove that assumption now. So let's let's think about the exact same picture, uh, but in this case there might be an invalid block. Okay, so here's the longest blockchain. Here's us, and we're trying to solve this. And in the meantime, as we're trying to solve this, somebody else proposes a solution uh, to the same previous block. And so the question is, uh, from the previous analysis, assuming that this is valid, we should switch, right? It's more profitable to switch than to continue here. That's what we've established. But there's this question that maybe this is not actually valid, okay? If it's not valid, then what should we do? Well, if it's not valid, then hopefully most of the other network will also realize that it's not valid and they won't extend it, okay? Um, so, if it's valid, uh, then most of the other networks uh, will be here. So I'll draw them. Okay, and if it turns out that it's valid, then most of the network is going to be trying to extend this particular block. Okay, and so, so the point for you is 
it's, it's really, really simple. The point for you is you want to be where the rest of the network is. Okay, because if you're where the rest of the network is, then when you create solutions where the rest of the network is, then the rest of the network is going to support your solution. Okay, you don't want to compete against the rest of the network. Um, okay, so so what happens here is uh, what you should do is you should try and figure out where the rest of the network is so that you have the greatest chance of uh, creating a block that will become part of the longest blockchain. And the simplest way to tell where the rest of the network is, is to actually just go ahead and check, right? You should go through this transaction and you should check whether it's valid or not. Okay, you can do that very, very quickly. It doesn't take very, very long. Um, and then depending on uh, if it is valid, uh, so let's say that, that uh, this happens to be valid, right? Then you can join in with the rest of the network here and if it's invalid, then you can join the rest of the network there, okay? Uh, and so uh, the, the bottom line is that uh, it pays to validate blocks. Okay, uh, by pays, what, what I mean is that uh, your, your solutions, your solved blocks are most likely to be in the longest chain. Um, so the danger is that if you get this block and you start extending it right away, let's say it turns out that it's not valid, right? Then everyone's going to ignore it. So even if you solve uh, an extension to an invalid block, uh, then nobody nobody wants this block, and so no one's going to want this particular block either. Okay, so you're going to get uh, discarded. You'll have your block discarded uh, as a result. So that's a, a different way of, of thinking of the same principle. Okay. Um, so, so what's nice about this is that that um, so we we have consensus for or toward I'll use the word toward uh, we have consensus toward a single block that was what we sort of established up here uh, towards a single or single chain I should say and we have a consensus toward a valid chain. In other words, we have consensus toward a single valid chain. Okay, that's that's sort of what all everyone's sort of pointing in this particular direction. Okay. Now, the final thing I want to talk about is uh, one one other case that we didn't exactly cover, uh, and so these are called withholding attacks. So let's start with the exact same picture. We have a blockchain, it looks like this. And we're here trying to extend the longest chain. And let's say that we're successful, okay? So we do extend this longest chain. Now, what we should do is we should broadcast our solution to the network and then everybody else, the rest of the network, uh, will join in uh, trying to solve our uh, particular block, okay? But what if instead of broadcasting it, let's say that we withheld it, and let's think about why you might do this. So if we withhold the block, even though we solved it, the rest of the network is still here. They're still trying to extend a block that we have. And let's say, for example, that we, we don't know this, okay? But let's just assume, just to, to think along the right directions, let's assume that for some reason we know that it's going to take them another two minutes before they solve a block. Okay, if we know that, if we're guaranteed that it will take them another two minutes, then we might as well wait two minutes before releasing this or one minute and 59 seconds before releasing this because then what we can do in the meantime is we can work on, we can get a head start uh, trying to solve this particular block. Okay, so we can get some cycles into trying to see if we can extend this. And if we get both of these blocks, then we're gonna get all the mining rewards of this and all the mining rewards of this, 
Okay, so if we're guaranteed that it's going to take a certain amount of time for the network to find a competing block to us, we'll spend that amount of time uh, trying to um, trying to find this other block. And if we find it in that window, then we release both. And if we don't, we release this one. Okay. Now we we have no idea when this could could be solved. Okay. It could it could come right away in a second, or it could take ten minutes. Who knows? Nobody knows. But what we have is we have a kind of probability. Okay. We have a probability distribution over how long it's going to take them. Okay. So what you can do is you can sit down and you can crunch a lot of numbers uh, that are going to have to do with what's you know sort of what's the expected time it will take them to solve. What's your expected time uh, in order to solve the second block? And you can work out a kind of formula that tells you basically, should you hang on to this block and try and get a head start? Or should you release it right away? Or should you hold on to it for a certain amount of period and then release it? Like what, what's sort of the optimal strategy, okay? Um, so the optimal strategy here is uh, been studied in the literature and there's, there's a bunch of different things uh, that, that go into parameterizing it. Uh, it's, so it's called selfish mining. And I'll, I'll just give you the bottom, you know, the, the, the bottom line of the literature. Um, basically, if you have less than a quarter of the computational power of the network, uh, then there's, there's no advantage to withholding. Okay, if you have somewhere between 25% and 50%, um, uh, so let, let me just draw this as an interval. Okay, then you can withhold and to some sort of financial advantage, okay? So I'm gonna make you, you know, tons and tons of money, but but it is slightly advantageous. And especially when you get up to a third of the network, uh, so some of the effects kick in at 25%, at a third, uh, other effects kick in. And so uh, it can be it can become profitable, okay? And then when you have more than 50%, uh, which is called, uh, it's usually called the 51% attack. So if you have 51% plus, uh, I'll phrase it as uh, more greater than or equal to 51% of the network or 50% plus one. Um, then what happens is uh, something else happens. Uh, so, so we actually call this the 51% attack. Once you have 51%, uh, what that means is that you can grow a chain faster than the rest of the network, okay? If you can grow a chain faster than the rest of the network, you can basically ignore the rest of the network. You can do whatever you want. So if somebody else solves a block, you can just continue to solve your own block. And eventually, you know, you'll extend your block, extend your block, extend your block. And eventually you'll outpace the rest of the network that's trying to, to not extend your particular blocks. Okay. So once you have 51%, um, not only, you know, forget about withholding, um, but once you get 51%, uh, then you can just, you can dominate uh, the network. Okay, so this 51% attack, uh, you can basically, you can dominate the network. Okay, and you can even go back in time, right? You could go back to some transaction that you didn't want that happened five years ago. You could fork from that position uh, and then you can eventually you're going to catch up if you have more computational power than the network. It might take you a very long time, but eventually you'll become the longest chain and then that transaction will not have happened. Okay, so Bitcoin breaks if one person gets uh, more than 51% and, and they do this particular attack. Okay, it, it might be the case that they get it, but they're, they're sort of benign or something like that. But um, anyways, uh, so 51%. So we do have this assumption, so very important assumption. So let me make a little point about this because it's, it's... So 51% attack. Uh, so under this condition, uh, consensus breaks. So you can't guarantee consensus anymore. And I'll note that if you're in this interval here, it's not that consensus breaks, it's just that you kind of get more money than you should. That's kind of what happens in this particular interval, okay? 
Um, but anyways, once you get above 51%, uh, consensus breaks. Uh, and so uh, Bitcoin assumes this never happens. In, in other words, they assume uh, it will never happen. Okay, and we've talked, you might have seen in the news, if, if you ever follow the Bitcoin news, that uh, people have suggested that this has happened, uh, in particular with these things called mining pools. And so mining pools is a, is a separate topic. I'll, I'll cover it in kind of the fifth chunk of what we're doing now, which is under the finances. We'll talk about uh, what are kind of the finances that go into mining and, and things like that. And so I'll talk about mining pools in that context. But Anyways, if a mining pool gets to 51%, it's, it's a little bit different, as I'll argue there, than a single entity uh, getting to 51%, uh, but, but we'll cover that there. Okay, so consensus in Bitcoin pushes you toward a chain that's, you know, everyone backs a single chain, uh, everyone validates every block inside of that chain, um, and, and so that's, that's the kind of consensus guarantees uh, that Bitcoin gives you. And this is, of course, at a, a very high level. It's, it's not very technical, but you could go and you could try and prove these properties. And there's a long range of literature for the competing types of properties like Bezant default tolerant protocols that, that, that try and do that. But anyways, I hope uh, this at least leaves you with the intuition uh, of what the consensus algorithm in, in Bitcoin is doing. 